Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. I am Martha Arkazuski. I'm the business strategy and operations manager on the pro team here at Meetup. Um, more importantly for today, I am an avid hiker. Um, and I would like to welcome you to another Meetup Live event where today we're joined by Meetup hiking group organizers, David and Letlet Grange and Sarah McKenzie. And they're going to share stories and photos of their amazing adventures at different elevations. And I'm sure you'll be inspired to explore the world and reach new heights. Before we start, we want to walk through some of the guidelines and the agenda of the event too. Okay, so guidelines for the event. The, uh, this event will be recorded, but don't worry, you won't be on the video and your audio will be muted during the entire event. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll have 15 minutes at the end of the event to walk through those. And finally, closed captioning is available. To turn it on, click on the live transcription button um, on the bottom of your screen and select your preference. Okay. And so the event today is going to be um, first an intro, five minutes, we're working through that right now. And then we'll do a show and tell where we'll start with some questions. Um, Sarah, David, and Letlet will share some uh, photos of their adventures, have some more questions, and then follow it up with a Q&A session um, based on questions that you have for them. Cool. So it's my pleasure to introduce our three organizers today. I'll start with David and Letlet. <clears throat> David and Letlet retired in 2008 to Arizona to begin exploring the American Southwest. They currently head up the Hiking Hikers Hiking Meetup Group, which has over 10,000 members and nearly 30 event organizers. When not hiking, Letlet and David also enjoy kayaking the many lakes and rivers in their area, mountain biking, house parties with friends they've made through Meetup, and traveling extensively, both locally and internationally. Welcome, David and Letlet. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Okay. Uh, and I'd also like to introduce Sarah McKenzie. Sarah is a London-based mountain leader and paddle sports instructor. She grew up in a great place to cultivate a love for the outdoors, the wilds of Maine. After university, she moved to New York City and taught horseback riding lessons in Central Park before donning pumps to take on an insufferable desk job. Eventually, she relocated to Europe, explored the Alps and the Pyrenees, and reignited her love for mountaineering and long-distance long hiking. She's passionate about nature and sharing her love of the outdoors with others and obs is obsessed with finding the perfect countryside pub to have a rest and a pint after a hike. Same, Sarah. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Cool. Okay, great. So let's start off with the basics. Can the three of you just tell us a little bit about your meetup groups? Uh, sure. Who would you like to have start? Uh, the first person who wants to start. Okay. Well, I'll tell you about our meetup group. We are in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we do have over 10,000 members and we've put on thousands of events since we started in 2006. Um, it's a great group. There's a lot of friendships that have resulted from this group, lots of marriages, no divorces that we know of yet, but quite a few marriages and uh, a lot of great friends. And of course, when you're out hiking, safety in numbers is always a good idea. That's great. <clears throat> Sarah, can you tell us about your group? Yeah, so I've been with Go London Hiking since 2017. Um, it was actually started by a gentleman named Gary Bebb about 10 years ago. We have almost or over 30,000 members now um, and four kind of full-time hike leaders doing day hikes. Um, but we also do hikes all over the world. We're really lucky because um, out of London, we do have so much countryside around us. So um, we do a lot of public transit friendly hikes, which is amazing. Um, so most of our day hikes are accessible to everybody by train. Um, uh, but we go all over the place, Scotland, Wales, um, the Lake District, which is beautiful in England. Um, 
and then yeah also trips abroad which are amazing that's great that's so cool yeah. Um, so, so can you tell us about why you started your meetup group, or if you weren't the person who started, um, why you decided to join the leadership team? For us, um, our group was started in 2006. We joined the group in 2008 when we moved to Arizona. Mm -hmm. And in our group, uh, we were asked by the then organizer or leader to uh, if we would mind leading hikes for the group and we began leading hikes within a few months of joining the group and uh, we just really enjoy it we enjoy the camaraderie of it and uh, the opportunity to uh, show people uh, the great state of Arizona and, and the southwest yeah so we basically uh, do a lot of exploration um, before we share our hikes to our members so mm -hmm. that we know exactly is the route to get to the to our destination so that you know you'll be more safer than you know uh, not knowing where you're going yeah do you have um like <clears throat> maybe like a lead team or like a core group of people who are doing those exploration hikes before you share with all of your members most all of our uh, organizers you know do their own lead work mm -hmm. um and we do have, uh, I think there's 28 of us. So everybody kind of is in charge of their own hikes and their own presentations. And we do it as a volunteer. We don't get paid. We don't pay our volunteers. It's, it's all, you know, uh, if you want to lead hikes for the, for the three H, then they may do so. So, and it's all volunteer. That's great. So. Love that. Cool. Yeah. And Sarah, what about you? How did you get started? Uh, so I moved to London in 2012, and I didn't know anybody here. Um, so I just kind of went on Meetup to see, like, oh, what's going on? And I found hiking. But I think my personality is um, I'm a little bossy. <laughs> so joining in, it wasn't really my style, but I just jumped right into um, to leading hikes. And in the UK, they love to give people pieces of paper. So um, they like to make sure that you're trained up on these sorts of things. So um, they have the, uh, the mountain leading scheme. And I um, took me about two years because they make you uh, log at least 40 days in the mountains um, before they start kind of letting you officially lead. And not, um, not 40 consecutive days. 40 no, days. not 40 consecutive <laughs> days. That would be a, a tough call, but just it oh, took me about two good. years to get those 40 days logged. Yeah. Um, and then they they test you on it and then um, you're uh, you're okay to leave. So um, so I did that and I just loved it. I loved every minute of it and I've loved organizing and working with different people and just being able to meet people and have this amazing community. That's great. So it sounds like you all sort of stumbled into to meet up in the hiking community. How did you originally find your passion for hiking in the outdoors? Well, uh, speaking for ourselves, we came from the Illinois area where we, uh, well, Illinois is a little flat. So we always tell people we didn't really hike there. We just walked around, but uh, we always like to be outside. And uh, when we came here to Arizona with all the mountains and lakes and rivers around, we just naturally fell in love with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, myself, I think I just growing up, that was kind of what I knew. Mm -hmm. We had quite a lot of um, trails and mountains and hiking around, but then I found as I was getting older, I was, uh, I would only go away on vacations and holidays on places that I was specifically looking to go hiking. So yeah, it was definitely uh, a bug that bit me. Keeps calling. <laughs> nice. Um, so I, I'm based in New York and one of my favorite things to do is urban hiking. So it's, you know, uh. same idea of like the flat idea. It's, yeah, <laughs> I think we can get. <laughs> um, okay. so. Can you tell us a little bit about what you enjoy most about hiking with the meetup groups in particular? Well, first of all, I mean, I think meetup 
when when we first moved here from Illinois, most of our family and friends asked us like, okay, why Arizona? You don't have friends or family out there. And through the meetup, we actually proved them wrong. We told them like, oh my God, you know, everybody's so friendly and and uh, we made a lot of friendship and, you know, and things like that. We even go traveling with our, you know, hiking friends and whatnot. So we have proven, proved or proven that it's, it's okay to move away from where you were, what places that you know that you can make friends from other uh, places. So yeah, that is one thing. And, uh, and I think it's just a forever making friends. It's, it's just, it's just the, the price of having to be in the meetup. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. Sarah, what about you? What do you enjoy most about your meetup groups? Um, I think just meeting people and hearing so many people from different backgrounds. And um, I think I missed it so badly. Um, in the UK, we had a pretty severe lockdown last year. And it was just months and months and months without too much social interaction. And last year, when we were able to start hiking again, everybody had so much pent up chatter. <laughs> but it's everything from like book recommendations and movie recommendations and good restaurants to eat at. Like this is all information that suddenly I was missing. <laughs> I really, really, um, I missed that aspect of it. Yeah. But also getting outdoors and, and just getting fresh air and seeing nature. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really I, like the way that, oh, sorry, go ahead, let, let. If, if I may add, I mean, our meetup is actually the, uh, the age ranges is from actually, I believe it or not, I, we have friends that they have nine-year-old kid that they go along with our hikes. From nine-year-old to 80 years old is our range of our, you know, age on our meetup. So it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's all different kinds of nationality and all. And it's that makes you, makes you feel good about it, that it's, you know, we open everybody in our meetup. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter who you are. I love that. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say I I personally love the way that when you're on a hike and like there's kind of this like community and camaraderie with people who you don't know you just see on the trail and so creating that within a group who's setting out together is you know even stronger and so it's really great to hear you've met people in a new new place that you've moved to and also you know in the place where you live can you know share those experiences yes. and through hard times too. So now we get to see some amazing photos that David, Letlet, and Sarah have put together for us about their adventures. And I'm really gonna pass this over to all of you as we walk through these. We would love to hear the stories about the hikes, where they are, who these people are, um, anything you wanna share, we, we would love to hear about it. Okay, I had to put my glasses on to see who those people are, but um, this is the Superstition Mountains in the Superstition Wilderness, uh, just to the east of Phoenix, Arizona. I'm sorry? The Tantu National. Yeah, and uh, here you see Letlet in the purple and uh, one of our friends, Karen Perry, and her friend, uh, Mary, who's also with us, this is one of the highest points in the Phoenix Valley. It's uh, over 5,000 feet above sea level. And the hike starts at about 2,000 feet. So it's about a 3,000 foot gain. It's a three mile hike. As it turns out, the lady in white lost her family in a plane crash in the <clears throat> rock formations just, just below uh, where we're standing here uh, back in 2011. Her uh, ex-husband and their three children, along with a couple other people, were killed in a plane crash. But every year, at least once a year, she asks us to take her up there and uh, so she can have some time with her kids. So that's what we're seeing here in this picture. Wow. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I have just um, one of her children, one of her three children that... Uh, has on the crash, uh, I have led a hike last, was it 
Sunday, um, it's supposedly her eldest is supposed to be uh, having a birthday. Uh, she should have been 20 years old. Mm. Um, so therefore, we uh, I took her there um, and uh, along with eight people, um, apparently uh, one of our one of our uh, one of her friends, because considered as a friend, is is one of the anchor of uh, Fox News channel number ten here in Arizona, and uh, the uh, the first rescuer, which is uh, Paul Bavu, uh, he's the sheriff of Pinal, Pinal County. So he they because they didn't know what it is and how hard it is that that hike. So uh, now they know. <laughs> That's really beautiful. Yep. The mountain in the story, wow. Okay, um, this one here is it's one of my favorite hikes too in the superstition wilderness in the National uh, Tanto National Forest. Um, it depends where, where actually you start, but there, it, it varies from 14 miles to 16 miles hike. And um, basically, uh, it, it depends on uh, someone's ability. Um, it could vary to like eight to 10 hours or basically maybe the whole day of hiking. But for us, it seems that we kind of like, uh, like hiking. So it's, it's, uh, it's not too hard for us. So, um, and um, there's accumulation gain, gain of, of, um, 3,500 feet on that one. Wow. Well, accumulation gain. Okay. And then basically um, the, tr the trail had started at 1673 feet. And uh, like I said, it, it varies whether where you start um, from 14 uh, to 16 miles. So, and that, that's me on the top there. Nice. <laughs> Nice. Anyway. Oh, uh, <laughs> you got this other one. Okay. This is, uh, well, here we are at Fossil Creek. This is in Arizona as well, but up north of us about an hour and a half. Uh, Arizona is part of the Sonoran Desert, which is one of the wettest deserts in the world. So in addition to deserts, we also have lakes, rivers, and waterfalls. And here we are at this beautiful waterfall with some of our meetup friends enjoying the uh, crystal clear waters of Fossil Creek. Gorgeous. And that's David, and that's me and our friends. <laughs> yeah. Gorgeous. Is this one of the hikes that you guys, uh, like you did self-exploration on and then took your members on, or was this somebody else's chosen, chosen trail? This is a hike uh, that's pretty popular and pretty well known here, uh, but we certainly, we always pre-hike them so we know where we're at and what they're about. This hike is, starts up at a rim and it hikes four miles down to mm. this area. So we always warn people as fun as it is to hike down there and as easy as it is, once you get down there and hang out in the water all day, you got to hike four miles back out. So be ready because there's not a whole lot of shade on that hike out. Nice. Yeah. Gorgeous. <laughs> there's, this is the one that we actually, uh, we call it wave cave. Um, um, over a decade, decade ago, um, we we have spotted this um, this view from the bottom, and we figured there is no trail up up, up to that spot. So we established a Karen. We Karen. I mean, I'm su supposedly you guys know what Karen is, a, a stack of rocks. Mm. So we 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 Karen. Uh, from the bottom to that cave so that we know exactly <laughs> where to go and whatnot so that you know when when we actually uh um brings our meetup we know where to go mm. and at that and at that time it, it's just like whoa getting to there is like of course there's no trail so therefore all the flowers in in the spring is just blooming and and like oh my god we were actually teepee towing 
because we don't want to hurt <laughs> the flowers. Yeah. And like, um, and we enjoy that. And and basically, this spot is just like uh, it when because we're the only one that's in there. So mm -hmm. there is no footprints. It looks like you're just like in the moon somewhere. I don't know. As that's the way we we found it. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, we enjoyed for over a year. And then we shared to our meetup, and then and other meetup, and all that. And now it's just a highway <laughs> going there. <laughs> but yeah. we we feel bad, but I, but yet we feel proud of it. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So. Yeah, and it's a cool and it's a cool hike. Nice. I'm sorry. Can I ask you to to tell us more about <clears throat> the carrying the rocks? What did you call that? And it is that Karen. It's Karen. C A I R N. <laughs> yeah, it's Karen. C A I R N. It's usually a small stack of rocks uh, mm -hmm. that kind of help people mark their way and guide their way. So when we first put the Karens, there wasn't much uh, of a trail, but because people start following Cairns, suddenly you end up with a, a much stronger defined trail. I believe I understand that that word Cairn came from the Gaelic meaning a little hill, just as a side note. Fun. And, and do you remember how deep is this cave, babe? That cave is about 110 feet deep and it's about a two mile hike up to that cave, four miles round trip. Nice, beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Sarah, we'd love to hear about these photos. Oh, so this was a trip uh, a few years ago where Gary and I, we took a group to the Isle of Rum in Scotland. Mm. Um, it's off the West Coast and it's pretty much, there's a few people who live there, but it's pretty, uninhabited. Um, so in Scotland, you can do a lot of wild camping. So we were carrying very heavy packs um, and camping just in very amazing places like this. Um, and because Scotland's so far up north, this was in the month of May, the sun doesn't really set till about 10 o'clock at night. So I made, I was very mean that day. And I made everybody go up to this top of this hill to watch the sunset at about 10 o'clock at night. And, mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of that picture. But um, in the background, you can see islands like well off in the distance and it's just a very peaceful, beautiful place. Um, and it's known because there's a population of red deer there and there's a lot of eagles, mm -hmm. um, see, like the golden eagles. And um, so we got to see those quite a lot. Wow, it's great. Mm. So this was a very fun trip. Um, uh, we did the Land Manilagavar to Thorsmark trip in Iceland. Um, you take a very rugged four-wheel drive bus into the interior and where they drop you off, you just start hiking. <laughs> Um, and we are also this, no, we must have just climbed a little hill because nobody has big packs on and that it doesn't look like, but we were camping and self-sustaining for four days. So we had huge packs. And even though this was June or July, um, <laughs> it's still Arctic there. So we have winter gear. Um, but what's very eerie about hiking in Iceland and camping is the sun doesn't set. So you're in your tent and you're waiting for that, the temperatures to drop to indicate it's nighttime and it's cold out, mm. but because mm. the sun never actually sets, it never gets cold. <laughs> That's so not, it's very weird. And so I don't know if anybody slept at all. We all had like our sleep shades on and we were trying really hard to uh, get a few, but it, it looks the same at one in the morning as it does at six, so. Oh, that's so funny. That's one of my favorite things about hiking is like you live by the sun or excuse me, by about camping, you live by the sun. And so it must be very disorienting. It is. <laughs> um, what's uh, what's some of the longest day hikes that you've, or like few day hikes, you said this one was four days that your group has been on. Um, 
Oh, so self-sustaining, probably no more than that, just because you have to carry so much. Mm -hmm. um, I do um, the West Highland Way in Scotland. I'm doing that actually twice in the month of May this year. And that one's a hundred miles. Wow. And we do that in seven days. So it's nobody's, uh, <laughs> it's like a good amount each day. Mm -hmm. um, but that's probably the longest hike I do. Mm -hmm. Are there like outposts along the way to, or? No? Yeah, it's very kind of well served for distance hikers. There's a pub and shops and places to stay every night. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cushy. And if worst, worst case scenario, there is like a train or a bus most nights. So if somebody really needs a break, they can kind of meet us at the next stop. Nice. Cool. So this was a trip I did last summer. Um, we went stand up paddle boarding instead of hiking all day, which was a lot of fun. Um, but that was in Cornwall, which if you've never been, it's a very, um, it's a really beautiful part of the UK where it's amazing coastline and just beautiful cliffs. Like at the, the coast path there, it's never flat. Mm. And they're one of the great things about the UK is they have preserved so many trails or places that you can walk that there's, a coast path that runs over 700 miles along the Southwest coast. It's called the Southwest coast. Um, and I have a group of hikers and we're just kind of, we'll go back every year and chip off another section of that. Um, so this is in a place, it's called the Lizard Peninsula. And we took a half day and went paddle boarding. And it was a lot of fun because it was almost everybody's first time. And I warned them, <laughs> you're going to go in. And everybody did, and it was fantastic. We had so much fun. Nice. Oh, that sounds so great. So this was another group we took to Kyrgyzstan a few years ago, um, which is a place that not too many people have gone to. And it's absolutely amazing hiking, as you can tell from the background. Um, we were up this is called nomads land so if we weren't camping we were staying in yurts with nomadic families and kind of sharing the table with them for dinner every night and it was just it was an amazingly remote place and it's all the peaks there are around like five to seven thousand meters <laughs> so there's just like amazing mountains all around you and um it's not a very comfortable trip. Um, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty rustic, mm -hmm. but um, it was just, it was an amazing experience. And I'm actually, I'm going back in August uh, so to great. explore some more because I think everybody who went on that just, they were so wowed by it. That's amazing. Yeah, I love, I mean, this is the, you know, community, the meeting new people through new experiences, through new adventures. That's, that's great. Incredible. Cool. Um, I, right, it is. Okay, so um, so we have a ton of questions that are falling in and we're, we're running a little behind, so, um, I had some more questions, but I, I really just wanna, uh, I'll focus on one in particular. What advice do all of you have for someone who wants to join a hiking group, but is either on the fence or someone who wants to become an organizer of a hiking group? What? Yeah, well, I mean, I would definitely say if you're moving to an area you have not been before, meetup is an excellent opportunity to not only learn about the area, to, but to meet other people. In terms of our, our meetup group, we have people that come really from all over the world and they, they ask to join the group and they say, you know, I'm only there for the weekend or for a week or for a month, do you mind? And, and we're so excited to have them and to show them uh, everything that's available here in this area and to answer any questions that they have. So 
I think the idea of meetup is, is phenomenal in the sense that it does give you that opportunity to uh, learn about new places and, and meet people that have like interests. In terms of being an organizer, that's you know up to everybody's individual desire uh, or even event organizers or, or hosts. You know, we always try to you know, make sure we have good people that lead hikes. We know them well before we uh, let, let them loose on the general public to uh, host and lead hikes. But uh, it's an excellent opportunity to meet people, no doubt about it, and to, to share all the beauty that there is around us. That's great. Totally agree. I think it's a great way to, to explore places. I'm in Mexico right now, and I found a meetup group, and we hiked uh, Hot Springs two weekends ago. And <laughs> great way to do it. <laughs> what about you, Sarah? What, what sort of advice do you have for someone who's on the fence of joining a group or on the fence of becoming an organizer? Um, oh, gosh, you just have to do it. I mean, there's so many, especially we're very fortunate in London because there are a lot of different groups, especially hiking groups. Um, so if one isn't the right one for you, you can always try different ones. Mm -hmm. um, for they, we have try to have hikes for all abilities and all levels. Um, so, but you can't always please everybody. Um, <laughs> we try. <laughs> um, but as far as organizing goes, yeah, it's just it's such a um, important thing to be kind of a cornerstone of a community by being an organizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Amazing. Okay, so we've got a lot of questions coming in from everybody who is uh, participating in the event. So I'll start here. Um, okay, so Anonymous asked, um, hi, George here. I'm a hike leader in Prescott Meetup Hiking Group with over 1,800 hikers. I would like to know how you best like to deal with a, a hiking group getting strung out with some really slow, some really fast, and everything in the middle. Okay, so uh, yeah, <laughs> how do you manage groups of varying uh, varying abilities? Um, well, for us, um, and I can definitely understand George's plight there in Prescott, which is one of our neighboring towns just to the north of us. Uh, uh, let let and I have it easy because there are two of us, and usually before the hike, we decide which one of us will be in the front and which one of us will be in the back, and. Uh, so we try to have a sweeper in the back. And if we do see that we're getting a little strung out, whoever's in front for the day tends to take a few more breaks and uh, wait a little bit of extra time, um, age the group. And then obviously whoever's sweeping in the back tries to push the group along a little bit faster, but uh, it is a difficulty. And it seems like the larger your hiking group is, the, the, the number of members you have hiking that day, the more strung out you might get. So we always try to keep our hikes limited to uh, 10 or 15 people, which helps keep the mix a little bit, uh, of the group a little bit tighter when we're hiking. And that's actually the guidance of the uh, wilderness to like not maximize it. Yeah, here in Arizona, most of the forest wilderness areas have limits as to the number of hikers you can have. And those limits can vary from six up to 20, depending on which wilderness we're talking about here in the state. Yeah, even though we actually um, tell on our description of our hike that you are responsible to your own safety, um, we still somewhat making sure that everyone gets home, <laughs> that you know we, we're, they're not left behind, mm -hmm. things like that, so. Sure. Good advice. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, with my hikes, I, we grade them either beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And we kind of expect people in the advanced group to not be falling behind. Um, so we definitely find that being specific with our pace and our speed and the kind of elevation gain that we'll have that day definitely helps because um, it just kind of puts people where they're most comfortable. Um, but also just keeping your group numbers manageable. Got it. Great advice. Okay, um, so we've got another question here from Philip. How do you optimize the number of people who will actually show up to your hikes? 
For example, do you keep track of each member's cancellations and no-shows and move them to not going or wait list accordingly? Uh, so if they're not showing up, would you, you know, put them on a wait list? Uh, I could jump in on that, I suppose. That seems to be the order we've been following for whatever reason, but uh, <laughs> yes, we definitely keep track of people that uh, sign up and do not show up. We don't necessarily send them a message or anything, but we do mark them as a no-show, which is very helpful for the other event organizers when they post a hike in the future and they see somebody who has a series of no-shows, they kind of know that they're probably not going to necessarily be there. Um, and sometimes we do, if we see somebody that's constantly no-showing, we do write to them and let them know that it's important, especially on hikes where there's wait lists that you not sign up and then not show up because there are people that are wanting that spot. Mm -hmm. yeah, we charge for our hikes. And I think that's a big, um, that's a big carrot for people to get out of bed in the morning and go hiking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. So another question here is what are the temperatures like on your hikes? Sounds like we have an interested member potentially. Well, we, we like uh, a warmer <laughs> um, <laughs> weather. So therefore, and we, in, in the winter, like we, we feel like it's still winter here in Arizona because of the temperature. It's kind of like fluctuate from, from the 60s to the 70s. Anyway, make the long story short, in the winter time, we actually, I, I actually, um, lead hike from starting at noon two o'clock three mm -hmm. o'clock um and uh knowing that um last that last sunday's hike knowing that it's gonna be not not a face i mean fast pace i had to start like a seven o'clock in the morning so it, it 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 depends but i'd like to be in in the warmer part of the day not necessarily like 85 to 100. And my, my point is like, you know, it's not, it's not hot, hot enough for the people because they, you, you know, people, you can't really um, satisfy them. They will be complaining. Oh my God, it's too hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would, like uh, yeah, I would add, I mean, um, in Arizona, it can get below freezing. Uh, we do have frosts in the winter time. And yes, in the summertime, it can be 110 or 115, but it is low humidity and it does feel different than humid climates. But uh, in the winter times, our hikes are usually 50, 60, 70 degrees. And in the summer times, we hike really, really early or really, really late. Yeah. Nice, just the time frame for your temperature. Like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. <clears throat> what about you, Sarah? Uh, so we hike year round just because we have, it's, it's a mild climate here. Um, we don't get too much ice and snow in winter and we don't get too hot in summer. Um, so it's quite fortunate that it's almost always okay to go out for a hike. Um, but uh, it's mostly just the rain. <laughs> you do need rain gear here. Um, well, it's not as bad as most people make it up to. Um, it just, you definitely need a rain jacket to take care. Nice. You just get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> Pull your socks up. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So from Mark, uh, Mark says, thank you for a great presentation. Just curious in all your hiking experience, have you ever encountered a wild animal? And if so, how do you handle it? Oh my gosh. Yes. Well, here in Arizona, there's a lot of wild animals. Uh, we have a bear, we have Gila monsters, we have snakes, we have bighorn sheep, uh, desert tortoise, all sorts of lizards, um, and uh, mountain lions, bobcats. Uh, but to be honest, uh, they're more afraid of us than we are of them, and they tend to stay away. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the rattlesnakes will usually rattle to let you know they're nearby and to stay away from them and usually it's just a great opportunity to view the wildlife and enjoy the wildlife uh, none of them ever seem to be much into attack mode here 
That's so many animals. And so surprised that bears are in Arizona. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yep. yep. Yes. No. <laughs> Sarah, I assume you have. <laughs> yeah, well, so I have in the States, definitely, especially in Maine, but here there's nothing that would bother you. <laughs> they've, they've hunted all their big animals centuries ago, so um, it's a little boring on the fauna side of things here, but also I realized when I started camping here for the first time in my life, I slept well in a tent because I wasn't terrified of something trying to get in or, or walking by at night. So um, yeah, the bonus being here is just nothing, nothing will, uh, will bother you really. Thanks. Yeah. There's always that, you know, fox scratching at the tent. <laughs> um, okay. I think we'll finish off with one last question here from Francis. What's the best way to get leaders for your hikes? Hmm. For us, um, we lead a lot of hikes and we observe a lot of people. And if we see somebody who seems uh, knowledgeable and personable and uh, outgoing, um, we oftentimes approach them. I mean, we do get approached by members who ask if they could lead, but we, we also approach ones that we particularly think would be well by the group. And uh, especially if they're in another area of the valley or the state where they could help lead hikes uh, in areas that maybe are underserved by our group. But yeah, we're always seeking uh, different personalities and different hike types, people and different speeds, uh, as Sarah mentioned, because we also lead hikes that are easy to hikes that are very complex or difficult. So we're always looking for people of different abilities too to help lead those hikes. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, I think we try to find people who are good people persons and like friendly, outgoing, happy people to lead um, and then we figure we can teach the navigation and we can teach the other skills um, but the um, being like personable and friendly and outgoing is a, a super important trait to have in somebody who's going to be leading groups yeah. great well thank the three of you so much for for spending your time with us today and sharing your stories and your photos it's like been very inspirational for me uh, to hear about this. I, I love it. And thank everyone for joining us today who tuned in. Um, <clears throat> we'll share their links and social media in the chat um, for you all. And then before we go, we've got two more slides, I think, right, Emily? Yes, quickly. Okay, so the first here is to help uh, everybody on the call find others with shared interest as well. Um, so we're offering 30% on your first subscription by going to meetupsavings.com today, find your next hiking group, book club group, whatever your thing is. And then the second and last thing I'll say here is that uh, we launched our podcast, Keep Connected with Meetup CEO David Siegel last year. So please take a moment um, now, it would be easiest, uh, to take out your phone and scan the QR code and give it a listen. Uh, it's uh, really, really great conversations about community and finding your people. And then finally, as a reminder, you can view a recap of this event in a few days on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com slash blog. And thank you everyone for joining us. Stay safe. Stay safe. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. See ya.